That's very kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, it's sometimes said that humans need religion, even if it isn't true. They need the comfort of religion. I think there's something rather patronizing about that, rather condescending about it, but that's what people say. Often atheists say it. Of course, you and I are too intelligent to need religion. But what about all those poor people out there who need the comfort of religion? Humanity's need for comfort is, of course, real. But isn't there something childish, something infantile, in the belief that the universe owes us comfort, in the sense that if something is comforting, that must kind of make it true. Isaac Asimov's remark about the infantilism of pseudoscience is just as applicable to religion. He said, inspect every piece of pseudoscience and you will find a security blanket, a thumb to suck, a skirt to hold. And it is astonishing how many people are unable to understand that X is comforting does not imply X is true. A related plaint concerns the need for a purpose in life. To quote one Canadian critic, the atheist may be right about God, who knows? But God or no God, it's clear that something in the human soul requires a belief that life has a purpose that transcends the material plane. One would think that a more rational than thou empiricist such as Dawkins would recognize this unchanging aspect of human nature. Does Dawkins really think that this world would be a more humane place if we all looked to the God delusion instead of the Bible for truth and comfort? Actually, yes. <laughs> Since you mention humane, yes, I do. But I must repeat yet again that the consolation content of a belief does not raise its truth value. I can't deny the need for emotional comfort, and I can't claim that the worldview adopted in my book offers any more than moderate comfort. If you're afraid of death, for example, you might superficially think that a priest who tells you that you're not really going to die would be more comforting than a scientist who tells you it is highly implausible that our individuality could survive the decay of our brains. But I have heard... I have heard experienced nurses who've worked all their lives in old people's homes say that the ones who are most terrified of death tend to be the Roman Catholics. <laughs> all that guilt fed from the cradle up and the terror of purgatory and hell. As for eternal nothingness, it's, is it really all that frightening? As Mark Twain said, I do not fear death. I'd been dead for billions and billions of years before I was born and had not suffered the slightest inconvenience. For me. <laughs> In any case, I don't think I've ever met anyone at a funeral who dissents from the view, my view, that the non-religious parts, the eulogies, the deceased's favorite poems or music, those non-religious parts are always more moving than the prayers. I want to end by reading the opening lines of a previous book of mine, Unweaving the Rainbow. These are lines that I've long earmarked for my own funeral. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Sahara. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively outnumbers the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I in our ordinariness that are here. We privileged few who won the lottery of birth against all odds, how dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred. 
Thank you very much.